Good uh, morning. Um, my name is Marianne Fourcade, and I am a director of UC Berkeley's Social Science Matrix. I am delighted to welcome you uh, to today's panel on Jovan Scott Lewis and his book, Scammer's Yard, The Crime of Black Repair in Jamaica. Today's event is part of our Author Meets Critics series, uh, which features critically engaged discussions about recent books by faculty in UC Berkeley's Social Sciences Division. For each event, the author discusses the key arguments of their book with fellow scholars with share, shared research uh, interests from other disciplines. Um, I will also announce uh, a few of uh, our upcoming events uh, that are coming up. On March 19th, we have a lecture by Evgeny Morozov, the author of uh, The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom. He'll talk about his uh, forthcoming book. On April 9th, we have the Social Sciences Fest, uh, where we will, be, uh, we will be celebrating the accomplishments of the Social Sciences Division and its faculty. And on April 19th, we have another author Smith's critic with uh, Armando Laramian uh, from the sociology department, and he will discuss his book, Redistributing the Poor, Jails, Hospitals, and the Crisis of Law and Fiscal Austerity. So if you haven't already, we encourage you to sign up for the Matrix, uh, Matrix newsletter. Now, before we get started, let me quickly review both the format of this virtual event and the features of this webinar. Um, so we will have uh, quick introductions. Uh, Jovan will open and describe uh, the central arguments of the book for about 20 minutes and then, uh, and then uh, the interlocutors, or otherwise known as the critics, will, will follow. Uh, and each for about 10 to, to 15 minutes. And then we will have a Q&A uh, where you are welcome to uh, write your questions. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. Jovan uh, Scott Lewis is an assistant professor of geography at the University of California at Berkeley. He co-leads uh, the uh, Economic Disparities Research Cluster in Berkeley's Othering and Belonging Institute. Jovan's research is concerned with the articulations of racialized poverty, which he examines uh, through questions of racial capitalism, post-colonial underdevelopment, and radical terms of repair. He has conducted research in Jamaica and these topics, which culminated, uh, culminated sorry, in the monograph we are discussing today, Scammer's Yard, the Crime of Black Repair in Jamaica. He is currently at work on his second monograph based on research conducted in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which traces the consequences of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Next, we will have Deborah Thomas. Deborah is the R. Jean Brownlee Professor of Anthropology and the director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also a research associate with the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg. Her recent book, Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, Sovereignty, Witnessing, Repair was awarded the Senior Book Prize from the American Ethnological Society in 2020. She has published articles in a diverse range of journals and has also co-directed and co-produced two documentary films on violence in Jamaica. From 2016 to 2020, she was the Editor-in-Chief of American Anthropologist, and she has served on the executive boards of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora, the Caribbean Studies Association, and the Society for Cultural Anthropology. So welcome, Deborah. And then last but not least, Nadia Ellis specializes in Black diasporic, Caribbean, and post-colonial literatures and cultures. Her book, Territories of the Soul, Queered Belonging in the Black Diaspora, explores forms of Black belonging animated by queer utopian desire and diasporic aesthetics. Her work on queer and Black performance, sexuality and the archive, and the diasporic city has been supported by fellowships and grants from such research bodies as the AAUW, the SSRC, and the UC Berkeley's Hellman Fund and Towns and Centers, Center for the Humanities. 
She teaches courses on a range of topics within her fields and regularly offers classes connecting literary cultures to questions of the city, migration, and sexuality and gender. She has received uh, UC Berkeley's Distinguished Teaching Award and the American uh, Cultures Innovation in Teaching Award. So I will let the three of you take it from here. Thank you for, so much for prom what promises to be a wonderful conversation. Nadia will moderate the rest of the panel, but for now, I will turn it over to Professor Lewis for the opening presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for the introduction. Um, thank you to everybody at Social Science Matrix for making this day happen. Um, you know, to be here with, with Deborah and Nadia is like a literal gift. Um, like no jokes. Uh, so I really do appreciate everybody being here today and everybody who's watching. Um, <clears throat> I know I might be the third person um, who you are here to see today, um, but that's fine. I'm glad to, you know, be the force that brings together the power, uh, you know, the powers really that are Professor Thomas and, and Ellis. Um, so, no, seriously, I do give thanks. Um, I want to, uh, you know, just appreciate the fact that you know, we are, you know, thinking about the question of repair reparations today, you know, amidst a context that, you know, is just entirely injurious um, and it's like the injury just can't stop. So hopefully today we, you know, not only just, you know, spend time thinking about my book, but, but you know, think about the, the very quality and context of our, of, our, of our circumstances and the longevity of those circumstances. So I want to begin, you know, with you know, kind of just explaining what the work is, you know, what the book is about. And then I, like the audience, will just sit back in awe and wait for, uh, you know, Deborah and Nadia um, to just, you know, just, you know, give us some wisdom and, you know, understanding. All right. So, uh, you know, so Scammers Yard, you know, the crime of, uh, what is it called again? The crime of black repair in Jamaica. So Scammers Yard is a story that emerges within the overlapping wakes of colonial independence and structural adjustment in Jamaica. Each of these equally weighted and enduring moments has defined and delimited the scope and scale of opportunity for many poor urban and black Jamaicans. These circumstances and their mitigation produced a novel sense of repair and a framework for reparation. The sense comes from the experience of the three friends that I worked with as a part of the Scammer crew um, named Omar Jr. and Duane. And they you know, formed this crew uh, that participated in what you know, has become called the Jamaican Lottery Scam. The scam is an intricate scheme that defrauds thousands or has defrauded thousands of primarily elderly white Americans um, and you know, encouraged them to send you know, scammers into Jamaica what often amounted to their life savings. The practice of the scam demonstrates the mechanisms by which they refashion themselves and their country and the broader global relations within which they both are set. These scammers understood that the world as it existed was not meant for them. And so they drew on novel logics of capital, criminality and blackness as a formulary for post-colonial repair to make a world for themselves and on their own terms. So the process for making this world was relatively simple. Omar Jr. and Duane, who were young, poor and black, wanted and needed money. They wanted money that was lasting, that was impactful and meaningful. In other words, they wanted money so that they could make life in their city of Montego Bay. They had lived much too long without it, and that life was one that they no longer wished to endure. Theirs was a life of sufferation, an inescapable condition of chronic poverty, foundational to life's experience and its very quality. That money could equate to life was not a remarkable fact for them. Money had always set life's tone. It was as if they intrinsically understood the intimate relationship between black life and economic value. When they had money, everything was nice and blessed even. When it's absence, but it's absence bred misery, frustration and vexation. The days they lacked money outnumbered the days that they had it. And those, bro those broke pocket days were the norm. Those days brought, in, you know, brought on a sense of worthlessness or as is termed in Jamaica, whatlessness. And being called whatless by their families and partners was a charge that cut deep into the anxieties and insecurities of masculinist ideals and expectations of financial caretaking and productivity. Because whatlessness is not just about earning, but also how one earns as a man. So Junior Omar and Duane's chance to make life would follow the Jamaican telecommunications industry's liberalization, which spurred the development of the offshore call center industry in the country. 
Located in Jamaica's primary free trade zone in Montego Bay, several companies arrived offering data and customer support services for companies like Amazon. The call centers would soon come to compete closely with the long dominant tourist industry in the local economy of Montego Bay, as scores of young Jamaicans competed for these white collar jobs. However, with low wages and high attrition, frustration, if not dismay, would overcome the promise of call center work. But within those circumstances, a new opportunity would present itself. With access to thousands of US-based customers' contact details and having learned the art of customer service, the lottery scam would prove the industry to be profitable for some local Jamaicans after all. While many theorized that the practice was initially a secret of the city's upper class elite, it eventually spread throughout Montego Bay's poor garrison communities, becoming a radical means of accumulation. Scammers mainly targeted vulnerable white American senior citizens, promising them various awards from cash to cars. Like the crew that I discussed in Scammers Yard, some scammer organizations used a sophisticated form of credit relations, telling their victims that they had been overcharged through a miscalculation of their credit card's APR. To receive the fund, in any scenario, they would have to pay a processing fee. The fees would often arrive in Jamaica on the same remittance networks of money transfer services like Western Union that had long propped up Jamaica's economy. The crew member's choice to materialize their ambition through a scam is appropriate given their read of the world. To Junior, Omar, and Duane, the world they live is bent and unyielding. Marked and marred by political and economic strictures that have long plagued Jamaica's development and still haunt the nation through the specter of structural adjustment, navigating contemporary Jamaica requires them to look at the world askance and maneuver within it accordingly. Their lives are situated within a post-colonial political condition of blackness, but framed by a post-structural adjustment ethic. Put another way, they were caught between their ambivalence toward political sovereignty and the opaque functionality of capitalism. Moreover, the state, itself caught within a reciprocal cycle of colonial indebtedness, was too compromised to offer much in the way of opportunity. Working with the crew and understanding the various scales of underdevelopment that determined their circumstances, I could sympathize with them, but I still wanted to fully understand the moral framework by which they could justify or make sense of their participation in the scam. I was surprised then when being inspired by a then current and popular song by dancehall artist Vibes Cartel, they argued that the scam was a form of reparations. The crew's reparative justification was very obviously convenient, but there was an undeniable quality and power to the rationale they articulated. Critically, I was following Deborah Thomas's urging that we use reparations as a framework for thinking. Thomas argues that doing so allows us to recognize the interplay of geopolitical scales and history and compels us to refocus our notions of citizenship, sovereignty, and accountability. Finally, I chose to take the claim as a valid one because it was born out of the genuine circumstance of intergenerational and structural post-colonial poverty. Right? And for too long had the discourses, claims, and arguments of poor black subjects been disqualified and rendered illegitimate. For the crew, the reparations they claimed from their victims had very little to do with the normative terms on which reparations are typically based. Rather than being situated within an argument about slavery, reparations were explicitly a matter of contemporary concern for them. The contemporary poverty that they experienced and used the scam to escape was more meaningful and identifiable than the injury of slavery. In this way, the crew departed from the pattern of reparations demand that was taking place across the formerly colonized world. The scammer claim did much to disrupt the usual discursive hindrances these demands faced namely recognizing deserving victims and critically identifying complicit and guilty parties. In taking this approach, scammers engage in various ways what David Scott calls the Jamaican rude boys refusal. He argues that this form of refusal recognizes the unattractiveness, if not expiration of the quote, old options of liberal progressive rationality from which predominant reparative frameworks are often born. Scammer refusal is paired with a form of self-fashioning produced by vernacular articulations that resist relying on or investing in, em in emancipatory ethics. This move frees the scammer from being bound by liberal, respectable, representational politics. Moreover, the scammer embodying this rude boy refusal expands beyond the respectability underpinning the reparative framework and proposals from reparations leaders and programs. Those frameworks demand a collectivist mode of recognition that can simultaneously reflect the scales of injury and recompense. An example is the CARICOM Reparations Commission and their platform, which is a, a joint 
uh, effort of the Caribbean political and economic group of nations to seek reparations from former colonizers. The commission or the CRC invested in the post independent structure of development and, and advanced a program that seeks reparations for the various social ills and structural disinvestment that the Caribbean region has endured since slavery. These consequences are framed as a collective grievance with the collectivity of the claim demanding the integration and compliance of all claimants. Because of the criminality, scammers are discursively and morally excluded from respectable integration, but they also willfully refuse that integration. Critically, there is a recognition that the CRC demands a little more than an iteration of the previous and failed promises of freedom. If emancipation had its limits and independence provided arrested sovereignty at best, then so too would be any formal and sanctioned reparations fail to bring about repair. And so untethered to the teleology of liberation, the scammer can prioritize his preferences and ambitions to shape a more honest and thus novel sense of repair, which is the capacity to accumulate. Admittedly, accumulation as a reparative possibility cannot accommodate a neat or scalable articulation of reparations, especially one that will satisfy a collective claim. As organized on a collectivist basis, reparations require the ability to accommodate a multiplicity of parties and a diversity of members. The scam and demand foregoes the complications of that accommodation by asserting the claim of injury as held by the black individual and that that claim is valid enough without concern for recognition because repair is not given but taken. The scam therefore qualifies as reparation simply because the scammer says so. Herein lies one of the most central challenges of any reparations program, the ability to argue for the validity of the claim. The scammer refuses to argue and refuses to concede to the requirement of validation by sitting out and outside the normative demands of recognition. The scammer rationale radically enables the scam to be interpreted as a legitimate form of reparations. The scam's reparative formulary is radical and is radical because it mobilizes a reparative logic capable of reformulating the sites and perpetrators of post-colonial transgression and it does so in a manner that stretches and bends the conventional history of colonial exploitation. The reformulation is possible explicitly because of the spatial and racial rec uh, negotiations of scammer recognition. When answering my question of how they could think that scamming North Americans could pay the reparative debts earned by the centuries of British slavery and colonialism, one member of the, of the crew replied in turn with a question, aren't they the same white people? Joining the reconfiguring of time as a reparative marker, this crew member had brought up something unexpected but unmistakable. Indeed, they were likely the same kind of white people if we overgeneralize the Anglo influence in the United States racial formation. Still, I initially thought they must have been different because of their colonial past. But by lumping both the British and Americans together, the crew member engaged in a semiotic maneuvering that accounted for a long history of Jamaican experience where the British and then the Americans functioned in the same capacity. In practical terms, and to say nothing of the high level geopolitics historically at play, if the British once had Jamaicans work the plantation, the Americans now have them work hotels and call centers that still trap them in cycles of poverty. This is a the logic then of white fungibility that shifts the burden of proving the deserving of reparations away from black subjects who needed to provide evidence of their injury. And instead it places that burden on whites to disprove their legacy of inducing harm. Moreover, rather than black people needing to reconcile with their inheritance of injury, whites would need to reconcile with their history and inheritance of harm. This move opened up the scope of culpability it upends the troubling calculation that reinscribes colonial property logics back onto black subjects in each geographic context as represented by the arguments of who owes whom. Again, through refusal, the crew radically redefined the normative geographic delimitations of reparative blame. The process uncovered or made bare and apprehensible the true interconnected crime of Western development. In other words, there was not just one guilty party. It was every party that participated and then benefited in any way from their current poverty and the system that produced it. The rationale is a demonstration of what Obika Gray calls a disjuncture between the misery and hardships of Jamaican's lived experience and the imagined experience of participating in a material well being of America. As I write in Scammers Yard, the Scammers produce an accounting that skips across time and geography to transform Britain's transgression into the United States. 
This is a genealogy that can be traced through the well-documented post-colonial custodianship of Jamaican exploitation, which has changed hands over the decades with the reorientation of British Jamaican trade and political relations to that of Jamaica and the United States. As a result, scammers explore the geographic remit of injury and responsibility to offer novel and capacious terms of transgression. The mobility of transgression is made possible by the sophisticated capacity to trace colonial debt through whiteness across time and space. The reparative debt, specifically its mobility, is made apprehensible because of its core racial capitalist foundation in whiteness. This whiteness, the kind that is the same between British colonials and middle-class North Americans that scammers target, serves as a mode or function of inequality and thus offers a steady marker of blame across its permutations and exchanges. The operation of whiteness facilitates a transferability of debt as an object that is overrepresented to draw on Sylvia Winter's determination of Western hegemonic formation. Therefore, the white Western project's geographic scale and scope have meant that its overrepresentation can be manipulated wherever it is most vulnerable. This is the sophistication of the scammer's reparative project, and where it succeeds, to use a generous term, compared to where most conventional reparations programs fail. For example, the CARICOM Reparations Committee struggled because they have made their argument and have taken their claim to the most impenetrable and intractable sites of the Western project, which is the state. But for the scammer who recognizes the subjective flattening that makes racialization possible, the white state is no different or less complicit than the state's white subjects. And here's where the convenience of the scammer notion of repair demonstrates its genius. With this approach, the scam broadens the ability for claims to be made at a growing scale charted along the tangled path of relations that have been made through globalization and the compounding of injustices carried forward by a neoliberal economic policy. This move remedies the full depth of the colonial injury by recognizing the fungibility of whiteness. Using that fungibility rearticulates whiteness as a modality capable of carrying blame and holding it in sites that facilitate the most accessible claim making for repair. Fungible repair reconfigures the basis for repayment on terms most suitable for the scammer satisfaction. Other more conventional programs for reparation are hampered both materially but more importantly discursively by fixed ideas of blame, which are rooted in a morality that is primarily the making of the colonial powers to whom they owe their injury. But with a deft shifting of blame through, through relocation, scammers manipulate the charge. Their practice, therefore, eschews the need to be made right by the assertion and the acceptance of colonial wrongdoing. So admittedly, set against the kind of broader movement for reparations, which has seen growing political recognition, the scammer framework would very unlikely qualify as legitimate. My point has been neither to legitimize the scammer rationale nor to endorse the criminal modality by which it is executed. The power and value of the scammer claim, however convenient, is that among the various operations frameworks, it is the specific and personal ideals that make up the experience of living in injury's wake that matters. Moreover, emancipated from the expectations of both respectability and collectivity, the scammer reconfigures a sense of repair as a direct and undiluted satisfaction of those who carry any reparative claim. Through this reconfiguration, scammers upend the conventional relations between North Atlantic powers by eschewing any expectation for mutuality recognizing that the world as it is, by design, will never function on terms of equality. Thus, if not formally so, reparations must be taken by whatever means, as long as those means satisfy their individual pursuits, which unapologetically qualify as repair. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jovan. Um... Well, in my remarks, I will sort of pick up on a number of the themes that you've um, raised, but by way of starting in the spirit of full disclosure, um, I want to say that when I first met Jovan in 2012, he was at the tail end of his fieldwork in Montego Bay, and he came to link with me and my collaborator, Junior Waterburn, at the annual Coral Gardens commemoration. And um, this is a commemoration for a particular event in 1963 about which we had at that point recently um, made a film. But the conversations that we started in Montego Bay have continued over the years in 
Jamaica, in American Anthropological Association meetings, at Amer uh, Association of Black Anthropologists meetings, at Caribbean Studies Association meetings, um, in London, and in Beijing. Um, so let me just say at the outset how much of a fan I am. And I should also remind everyone that this fantastic book is really a small part of his broader research into the ways that notions of culture and history influence the ethical strategies for survival that people use within a market economy. Um, and in fact, um, Joanne's dissertation research was aimed at shifting the discourse on the market in order to historicize it within the particular context of plantation slavery, ethnic entanglements, and cultural politics in Jamaica, but more widely the former uh, British Caribbean. And so his dissertation uh, focused on markets in Jamaica and particularly on tourist markets in Montego Bay. And he tracked the ways that money and products circulated among and between a number of different and variously located constituencies in Western Jamaica, including both formal and informal Jamaican craft vendors and city Indian shopkeepers. And many of the latter are embedded within these longer trajectories of indentured labor through family circuits that actually span the globe. So in the dissertation is where we see Jovan highlighting vendors own analytic frames like bad mind and sufferation, right? Which he mentioned earlier, but it, which he sees as a kind of material and affective condition that's rooted in a long history of structural inequality that seems insurmountable, right? And he used these frames to provide insights into the ethics guiding their participation in and conceptual framing of the market, right? So he situated these within longer trajectories of both local and global market systems into which Jamaicans have been embedded and also the broader limitations produced by the dominance of the tourism industry. So when the lotto scandal, or as you said, what came to be understood as the lotto scandal started unfolding in um, Jamaica and when he realized he was friends with some of the people who were involved, he began thinking more about, friends, sorry, <laughs> about what it could tell us about contemporary ethics related to survival and vernacular notions of reparation, which he's just talked about um, and which I'll talk about a little more too. And so here you have the result of this thinking. And I have to admit that I was really nervous for him at the time and mentioned that he should deeply anonymize his data since the FBI at that time was conducting an investigation. I was worried that he would be subpoenaed. Um, but anyway, I mentioned this mostly for those of you here who are graduate students, um, because it should stand as an example for you of how research projects evolve and of how one might thoughtfully rework a dissertation into a book. So as uh, Jovan said, Scammers Yard analyzes how the young uh, Jamaican men involved in the transnational process of capital extraction, otherwise known as lotto scamming, mobilized aspects of a new technology, which was the VOIP phones. And the, the actual technology here is super important because it's what delinks their bodies from a location in virtual space, right? And they're mobilizing this kind of new mobile technology in order to address their own lack of mobility, both socially and um, materially. So for them, as Jovan just laid out, bilking American senior citizens of retirement savings became a form of reparations and a reversal of traditional power relationships through the creation of wealth and the construction of new notions of citizenship. And I think Jovan's analysis of these processes highlights the importance not only of thinking through the afterlives of imperialism in a variety of ways, but also thinking of the afterlives of structural adjustment and the various policies that were implemented across the global south after um, 1989, most particularly, and the ways that these have structured people's understandings of their own opportunities and therefore also of their worldviews. So one of the things I think that's so important about what Jovan shows us through this book 
is how, as the state abandons its mandate to provide for the population because of these kinds of neoliberal policies, right? Forms of both licit and illicit autonomy flourish, right? And these forms go up and down the entire economic spectrum. As they emerge, they also build on already existing modes of criminality, corruption, and wealth generation, uh, with the latter otherwise known as the longer term processes of indigenous dispossession and plantation slavery. So Jovan wants us to see how the framework of reparations as articulated by the youth with whom he worked can allow us to see that their participation in the Lotto scandal heralded the death of post-colonial parameters of respectability as the means toward meaningful citizenship. And this is key. And he talked about this a little bit, but I just want to sort of draw our attention back to that because it has everything to do with the ways sovereignty is being imagined outside of the framework of the state system that we were given, right? Um, so youth who participated in the lotto scam, he asserts, found a way, at least temporarily, to imagine their futures in Jamaica, rather than needing to migrate in, in, in search of a better financial situation. And this is really important because in undoing a familiar narrative related to opportunity, both in terms of what it should take to build life in Jamaica, right, like education, respectability, et cetera, et cetera, um, and, uh, and in terms of um, you know, attempts to seek fortunes through the well-trodden paths of diaspora, right? And it reconfigures the parameters of what aspiration looks like today, right? So lotto scammers, as he said, they're not seeking an escape, right? They instead want to quote, live fully where they were. And that's really um, key, I think. So I want to read just a couple of passages in order to think through some of, um, some of these important interventions. And the first is on page 52, in case you have your book and you want to follow along. Jovan writes, to be socioeconomically immobile and unproductive is failure. However, failure is all but guaranteed when one operates in accordance with the normative notions of the economy given poor Jamaican's position within it. And this functioning leads to a sense of market opacity. However, where opacity makes up the circuits within which capital circulates, poverty is the impenetrability of the circuits of capital normalized as economic failure. This view reflects a perception of the world in which the economy induces the simultaneous registers of belonging to it, but also being disqualified from it. And thus within the context of, uh, and, within the context of suffering, the history of political economy has produced, poor Jamaicans have access only to what Fanon noted as the muscular dreams, dreams of action, dreams of aggressive vitality, of the colonized, All right? So here we're getting a kind of reoriented economic framework and, um, and an understanding of uh, how when people are unable to sort of make sense of their place within the quote unquote legitimate working of a political economy, they find ways to, to circumvent it, right? Um, and that their positioning always excludes them from a better understanding of, or a niche within the sort of normative dimensions of political economic participation, right? So they hustle and having worked in call centers where they were trained in customer service, empathy, and problem solving, they developed the skills because one needs good skills, you know, for scamming. And many of them, he notes, had also been previously trained within one or another of the vocational programs on the island. So they will have also have gained experience in customer service through local channels, right? So on the whole, they also have a very sophisticated understanding of how debt and credit works in the lives of those they are scamming, which is to say that it takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of work, and a lot of understanding to be a successful scammer. And they saw this work as a form of structural readjustment. Again, key, right? The counter to the kind of structural adjustment from which they suffer, right? 
So framing their ethics of seizure, and that's Jovan's phrase, as an assertion of a reparative framework signals a sensibility in which their crime, as he puts it, was not one produced by their own criminality, nor by virtue of some Jamaican pathology, but as the result of how modern capitalism functions in the region, right? So here we see a reorientation of the notion of criminality, which is again important to where we later get to with reparations, right? So seizure in this case is the result of a quote, moral obligation to recuperate debt for their colonial injuries. And in this way, a lot of scammers reframe the normative juridical modes of reparation in which, as he said earlier, accountability is tracked from a culpable injurer to an individual or very infrequently a collective who is injured, right? And within this construction of reparations, one must be able to make the chain of injury clear and the reparation must come from the perpetrator or their descendant and it must go to the injured. So in this case, with capital extracted from white American senior citizens, not the agents of British colonialism, whether banks or merchant houses or plantation owners or corporations, and payment is made not to specific descendants of those originally injured, but to random youth, right? But youth found that anything that mitigated the allure of the United States and allowed them to make life at home rather than trying their luck with minimal formal skills abroad seemed to them to be a form of legitimate reparations for the broad injury of coloniality and its aftermath. Okay. So what Chauvin is showing us is that lotto scammers are correctly identifying their position within a global landscape. They're accurately diagnosing the origin of their position within imperialism and slavery. And they're reframing the language of reparation to include white America within the continuum of accountability, given the dominant position of the United States in relation to global economies of capital accumulation and debt. So as a result, he's redefining reparations as a process rather than an event and as a process that is necessarily cumulative and one that really has the potential to transform ontological blackness into something of value, right? Make a black life actually matter, yeah? So the second passage I want to read engages this very redefinition and this is on um, pages 147 to 148. So he writes, Reparations thinkers and advocates have mobilized a concept that goes some way in re reconciling the temporal complication through the operation of debt. For them, reparations claim is undergirded by terms of debt where Caribbean debt, in the case of Jamaican reparative claims, is quote, the other side of European theft, right? The politics of debt and theft are intimately connected and have together produced this condition of suffocation. And then later he writes, debt in this context functions as part of an inherited racial sin and therefore has a potent value because it both contains the qualification of the crime of slavery's recognition and serves as the quantification for its repayment. So here, Jovan is giving us new lenses through which to understand racialized poverty. Right, lenses that encourage us to think relationally and historically about contemporary economic patterns and that position the Caribbean and the African diaspora more broadly at the center of these patterns. In his attention to the ways inequality, both globally and locally, morphs and reproduces while morphing, he also gives us new ways to think about the ethics shaping people's responses to inequality. And at at the same time, he's showing us that what others have called a crisis of sovereignty has led to, quote, a life lived within the deferral of reparations for slavery, right? And this not only perpetuates imperial domination, but also a sense of blackness that remains rooted in property relations, right? And you alluded to this, Joanna, in your opening remarks, but I'm going to conclude by reading one more passage that uh, is where you really develop that last point. And this is on page 173, and then I'll skip to 175. So in a troubling way, the United States owing African-Americans, France owing Black Haitians, and the United Kingdom owing Anglophone Caribbean Blacks reinscribes colonial property logics back onto the Black subjects in each geographic context. 
The scammer logic has made evident that a truly reparative, by which I mean radical, and this is still Jovan's voice, means of repair, one that can accommodate the sheer weight of the, of the injury of Blackness, is one where Black people, as collectives, but also as individuals, can determine the value and thus the cost of their own repair. And for me, that's a, that's a really important encapsulation of the meaning, the reformulation, um, both ontologically and epistemologically of Blackness and of the value of Blackness. And I, I think that's a, a provocative um, way to sort of summarize the discussion of reparations and one that I hope that we can talk about more. What a pleasure to be in conversation with you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and Javon, congratulations on this book. It's an extraordinary achievement. And it, it very much moved me, actually. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, because I think that the, the kind of scholarly care and attention um, and the patient time that you spent with this crew of Jamaican men does actually move in the mode of repair. Right? And that's something that I've been tracking in different ways in my own work. Um, I sense in the, in the clarity of this book, in its unflinching gaze at what exactly was happening in the lanes of Montego Bay and the wireless transfer zipping across the Caribbean Sea in some heated years over the last decade and a half, I sense a desire to redirect our attention in a few ways. For one thing, I think, Jovan, that your desire is to set down precisely what all of this activity meant for these men for their aspirations in the world, their close reading of their economic situation, their understanding of their relationship to Black diasporic masculinity. Um, I think Javon sets down too what this period in Montego Bay and the phone lines and internet wires connecting it to places like the Midwest and North the South of the US means for a collective understanding of contemporary capital and histories of Black labor and debt. And I think both Javon and Deborah's comments so far have really just clarified the way that the book lays this out so beautifully. I sense in Javon's interest in, in, a, in both of these sets of issues around constructions of masculinity felt experiences of one's life and with a collective idea of what black labor, debt um, and capital means. I sense in this a sort of desire to seize a larger and deeper understanding of the relations of the scam from the discourses that we've been given. Because of course, you know, in the US there's been a lot more language recently around scamming, rather via the trick of millennial work, or the antics of erstwhile German princesses, so-called, right? There's a kind of popular discourse around scamming um, or grift that I think, um, as, at least as I've seen it, often veers between a kind of quasi-admiring language of the hustle or else more pointed political critique of what it has meant in late stage capital in the industrial North to be placed in an unwinnable position of nonstop labor, ever receding choice and the compounding necessity to perform victory. Here again, I think as Jovan makes clear, the Caribbean and the black worker offers a prototypical analysis for the predicament that many people now find themselves trying to understand. By framing this predicament of the crew within the discourse of reparations and by describing the, the almost seamless transition from the tax scammy labor exploitative offshore, offshore free zone of US call centers, to the techniques and technologies of the phone scam, I think Javon has made a broader based analysis of labor and debt available. The diasporic, of course, has a way of showing how large distances are rather more intimate, how disparate lives are rather more entwined, how spaces can replicate themselves, proliferate, generate predicaments and problems that require both wider and more focused attention to begin to even try and solve. So for me, the way that this book seizes meaning from the crew's years of hustle and fraud made me look anew and experience again, and actually with a certain kind of breathlessness, I literally felt that, um, a few important things. For one, I noted the, the truth of where Junia and Duane and Omar's desires lined up with my own. I shared, for instance, their desire for mobility, um, which Deborah has, has very helpfully reframed, right? That, that Mobility used to be about migration, and now it really is about saying, no, I want to be here, but live fully, but it's still structured within a discourse of circulation, um, of not being fixed or static. And I share that. 
um, structural forces and, and just sheer luck allowed me to play that desire out into the reality of the job that has me talking now. <laughs> Um, I share too a desire for my labor to be recognized as worthwhile, right? A desire that has taken me and the scammers into radically different work and fields, but our shared blackness cast in some fascinatingly similar light the sort of cyclical properties of the demand to produce and the peculiar psychic effect of that demand on one's own experience of one's personality. Above all though, and this is where the suffocation feeling was most experienced, I, I re-engaged the crushing burden of post-colonial national debt and the social and economic precarity that flows inevitably from its infinite ongoing mess. The never to be completed indebtedness of IMF borrowing and structural adjustment, the telling detail that Javon provides that Jamaicans have now paid back $1 billion more than was ever borrowed, and that 9 billion and counting of mounting interest is still to go. That for me is the airless chamber in which these dramas is playing out. And so for the so-called middle income nation of which Jamaica is, Jamaica is supposedly a part, you know, folks get a glimpse of possibility at the horizon that you can never reach. And in this way, the story that is told in Scammer's Yard reveals a sense in which global capital and post-independence plantation economies can feel like a chilling and never ending video game a simulacrum of possible wins, engaging adrenaline and dopamine in equal measures, but ultimately leaving all of its players spent, empty, done. So I know that so far, I am just restating some of the achievements of the book, Javon. <laughs> I promise you that as per the genre of these events, I do have a couple just of uh, broad inquiries, you know, things that um, I'm finding myself not arriving at, at settled answers to, um, and that I'm really grateful to be able to put to, to both you and, and, and Deb, especially around the question of repair and reparations. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be able to engage the audience as well on this, because I think, I think some of these questions are, are so thorny that we just need to talk more. But I just want to linger on the way that the book moved me because it feels important to mark that as part of the achievement as well. You know, it's not often that a scholarly project is moving <laughs> and one must acknowledge this. Um, and, you know, I would say that surely some of that, you know, the achievement of, of Scammer's Yard on me has to do with my own relationship with Jamaica, right? With its sense of constraints and histories, entanglements and possibilities that I know very well. But I think that Javon has also offered a text in a moment when we are all, wherever we are from, grappling in new ways with the meaning of work, the burden of debt, the maddening way that capital makes us both quite intimate with each other and also radically, horrifically divergent in our fates. And suppose I, I think what I'm trying to say is that I want to mark the way that your book, Javon, says something very clear about operations that are often mystified. Um, and I'm also, as I said at the beginning, uh, gesturing to a discourse of attention as repair, right? I find myself returning repeatedly in my writing and teaching to a call that comes from scholars in Black literary studies that inspires the tonality and direction of my own attention. You know, the call by, uh, by Christina Sharp, for instance, that reminds us that the aftermath of social diagnosis of Black life is, requires a kind of care in thinking her call resonates with an earlier one by Kara Keeling that the work of black attention needs to be caretaking and not surveillance, right? Looking after our subjects, not merely looking for them. And it reminds me so of so many black scholars um, who work to attend to the rich and delicate social lives that produce the phenomenon that we study, not the simple rank spectacle of that phenomena alone. And so I, I really felt that your book did this in the care and attention that it gave to the precise kind of logic that the crew engages in, in the work that they do. But it throws up all of these complexities as well. And so I'll just, I'll just list a couple of them for me. There's two broad categories. One for me has to do with precisely what you and Deb focused on, the relationship amongst debt ethics and the quality of repair. And then the other has to do with the sexuality of the scam. So in terms of debt ethics and repair, right? You know, the, the ethics of holding post-colonial countries to austerity inducing interest-bearing debts that they can never repair in a context where debts have not been paid to exploited laborers, those ethics feel clear to me. But the book is now wrestling also with how reparative claims can even, even, can even be made in the contemporary era. A conundrum that I continue to find really maddening, and I think both of you actually spoke to this so beautifully, um, for one thing, finding a shared language to articulate what is clear in some quarters but not in others places a demand 
right, on Black citizens and subjects themselves to articulate what this might be. Um, and as Sadia Hartman has pointed out, as you say, Javan, um, this demand itself can be demeaning. But what your book is making me grapple with is how models of repair economic development all seem to require ethical framings that are inherently compromising, right? And I, I see how this is a problem outside of the scope of your own book because precisely the quality of attention you're paying to these scammers is about laying out very specifically how they see the framing of their own notion of ethics here. But I guess what I'm trying to sort out and I, I'd love to hear more talk about is, is how we can begin to identify a framework that doesn't um, in, in inherently imperil or, or debase the claim or the claimants um, of reparations or for people who want to continue to, um, to think about development models, right? I was thinking about all of the examples that you offered over the history of Jamaican citizenship and sovereignty, um, struck by the, the slow shift in Jamaica from a kind of black Christian form of ethics whereby sin can be overcome by just being really good to a related form of modern citizenship where hardship can be overcome by being busy, <laughs> right? Neither of which gets us out of the problem of individual responsibility. And I, and I sensed actually in a clearer way when both you and Deb were talking about the, the scammers claims of ethical um, seizure in their scam. Um, again, that problem of a kind of individual sovereignty, right? Which, which gives them a sense of agency, but doesn't get us outside of the kind of compromises, the ethical compromises that attend um, a kind of framework of responsibility that adheres in the individual. Um, yeah, the other framework I saw being articulated, which I think is also a conundrum, right? Is this kind of slightly different articulation of a kind of moral or ethical relativism. So it relies, of course, on a very acute analytic practice in Jamaicans to see the global economy for what it is, which is a game that they will never win. And that analysis grounds their sense of what ethics can look like, right? But it requires a kind of relativism in which some people, here it's the you know, elderly Americans who unwittingly give up their re retirement savings, have to lose. And I just wonder if there is, if there, if there's any possibility for framing a kind of reparative um, claim or practice uh, that doesn't rely on this kind of zero sum thinking or doesn't require a certain kind of potential in peril. So the second part has to do, as I said, with the sort of the, the sexing of the scam and the gendering of the scam, right? You know, and the sort of confounding way <laughs> in which um, this, this scam has a kind of um, origin story that points to some of the complexities of sex and gender in the Caribbean and in the diaspora more generally. So the, the facts that A, <laughs> the scam thrives on the hetero, perform hetero performance of Jamaican masculine smooth talking, enough argument, right? Amazing, <laughs> amazing. The fact that B, right, this is a kind of call center mutation, right? That relies on a certain kind of Jamaican heteromasculine performance, linguistic mastery, shape-shifting vocality, so revelatory to me. Um, but then there's something denser for me still and more confusing around gender here because your immersion in the gender demands on straight men, right? The way heteropatriarchy and capitalism is toxic for them as well. You know, the pressure to produce, the intertwining of identity with monthly earnings, all of this was very, very striking and quite clarifying. But what does it mean that earning is considered masculine in a context where women hold more jobs, right? Is there like a circular logic that is occurring whereby if women have jobs, then jobs must be for women? And then how do we disrupt that? And in terms of the gendered representation of certain forms of economic circulation, right? What, what exactly, who exactly is upholding this, por this polarity? Whereby, for instance, the foolhardiness of post-colonial savings versus the risk of spending down hot money, those become gendered binaries. <laughs> or the grind of holding three jobs versus the hustle of starting a business, that becomes a kind of gendered binary. Um, in a national situation and a diasporic situation where, where gendered economic practices actually feel more profligate than these binaries allow, I found myself wanting to get a bit clearer on how we gender the varieties of economic sufferation, right? And you know, this might just be so that we might see what kind of availability there is for like striking from these genders, <laughs> right? How people can, how people who are positioned on all sides of these gendered economic narratives might shuffle out from under them, swap out those discourses, query them. 
And then finally, you know, the detail that you that you provide the sort of origin tale of choice that the scam began with a prominent gay PNP affiliate, Kenrick B.D. Stevenson, who was eventually murdered and actually wasn't sure that the, the situation in which he was murdered and what what violence attended that. Um, but you track this discourse, I think, again, in a very clarifying way amongst the crew that sort of tacks the beginning of the scam to the middle and upper class and then by association with queerness. And it, that you know, both demonstrates the hypocrisy of middle class, middle class graft in Jamaica, as well as the toxic association of corruption with queerness, right? That still holds. And so again, another kind of um, tortured, tortured kind of logic or argument for the crew, which is that the hustle didn't begin with them. It began with middle class people who are also gay, but we are not gay. <laughs> it reminds me of that kind of muddled discourse whereby to be queer is to be middle class, is to be exempt from blackness, is to be exempt from the nation, but also somehow simultaneously at its corrupt and beating heart. So how does that origin story obscure greater working class participation in queer life and or forms of sexual violence or coercion that are interlinked with class privilege and capital? How might Stevenson's death, which demonstrates in yet another terrifying example, the connection between violent death and queerness, how does that figure into the sort of matrix of violence as it proceeds through black working class life in Jamaica more generally? Um, I guess trying to work out the quality of sufferation that makes the middle class queer man and the crew potentially intimate, right? Um, how can we begin to kind of line out their differing trajectories when they share this violent precarity? So there's obviously a lot more to say. Um, very, very eager to sort of begin the conversation with all of us. Um, I just want to say again, Jovan, thank you so much for the pleasure of reading the book and the experience that it ushered in for me. And, and Deb, being able to sort of hear your thinking about rep reparations in the wake of my reading, has been really wonderful. So I'm excited to have the conversation. And I, I suppose I'm also the person who might be helping to <laughs> bring in other voices. So we have until about, uh, 125 because the webinar is going to shut down at 130. So um, perhaps maybe we could just begin with Dev and Javon. You can just start to talk to each other about what we've already said. And then I will track the Q&A and bring in some other questions as well. So thank you so much. Hey Deborah, thank you, Nadia. Um, if I can just start by just saying, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I really am grateful, you know, and yeah, there was a a bit of a, a, a sense of feeling emotional, you know, throughout both of your responses, because, you know, what hearing both of you, and I told the people online that this was, you know, the main attraction, you know, um, but what, what was confirming outside of the argument? you know, the various arguments that I tried to make is that I've, I've made good on two core commitments, right? One, which each of you kind of represent um, as a part of your, or represented as part of your response to the book, which is that, you know, I think I've done good or well by the scammers in that, in that, you know, I think the text hopefully certainly resonates with their lived experience and lived experience, not just of scammers, but you know, of broader Jamaicans who are in this, this circumstance of sufferation, you know, um, that to me is, is the most important thing for, for my work. Um, the other is that I, I do feel as if, you know, like talking about debt there, I am very, I am very unapologetic and, you know, unashamed of the fact that my book is entirely indebted to a series of people, right? The, both of you on this call. And I think it's important to be honest and open through citationality to kind of say, well, listen, no, if Deborah Thomas says, let's use reparations as a framework for thinking, well, God damn it, go and do it. Right? <laughs> we try and say, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Right. And so for me, you know, so many of the both of you and so many of our other Caribbeanists, and I'm being very specific here, because I, I you know, my, 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 my assertion is that, you know, the kind of extractivism of the Caribbean continues in the realm of the intellectual, right? Where people love Caribbean theory, but don't love the Caribbean. Um, and so, and so like Sylvia Winters, not all the way from Jamaica, um, you know, but the, the point is, the point is that 
you know, I receive marching orders, right? From those people who I cite, mm -hmm. right? The book doesn't stand on its own. One should be able to go back as far as possible and to see Scammer's Yard as being, you know, a kind of continuation of the argument because what is so wonderful about, you know, the kind of work that comes out of the Caribbean is that there is a, you know, a, a complex sense that, you know, freedom isn't everything. There is more than freedom, right? Perhaps we might be kind of stalled in the discourse of sovereignty, right? But that it is a, a, a three for us, right? That we are actively pursuing a really deep understanding, right, of what, as Deb calls it, what it means to be human in the wake of, of the plantation, right? And so for me, I just wanted to say that, that, that if nothing else, that both of you have given me, you know, that sense of satisfaction that, that I've, 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 I've made good on my commitments. Um, and I'll see you all later. No, so <laughs> I don't really wanna, you know, cause I wanna, I wanna sit with what both of you have said and I don't wanna like spoil what both of you have said with what might be, you know, like a underbaked response, but you know, there is, there is, you know, just, something about this question of repair and, and sufferation that, that, that we have to think about very seriously. And so if, if, if you don't mind, because I can't believe we only have like 15, 20 more minutes, right? And, and there are questions in the Q&A. But so I want to say, you know, in a way, responding to some of, of, of what both of you have said is that sufferation, sufferation is the, the kind of baseline for the context. The scammers represent, and, and thank you, Deb. Boy, people, you can know people for a long time, right? So the fact that, you know, I'm really glad that Deb went back to my dissertation. Nobody, please look it up online. It's fine. Um, but it's important to kind of go there, right? Because what the dissertation showed was how a series of groups and actors were responding to sufferation, right? Because although I argue that sufferation as a kind of ontological framework is in many ways totalizing, it doesn't necessarily preclude variation in response, right? And in a way, you know, Nadia, that, that kind of begins to, to get to kind of answer some of your question, right? Whereas the scammers, the scammers who themselves are trapped into this kind of heteronormative anxiety, right? Like there was a lot of anxiety when the scammers were like, yeah, 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 the thing might have started amongst that group, but don't worry. We're not one of them. You know, I mean, there's a great deal of anxiety um, that really speaks to the, the variety of lived subjectivity in, 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 in the country. Um, what we have, and I think this is part of the question, you know, that this is the core question, actually, I think of Caribbean studies is how do we reconcile that diversity? How do we reconcile that variation? And it seems as if every time we come to some understanding, right, in this, you know, creolization way, we seem to just prop up more modes of subjectivity, more modes of becoming and being in this context. And so we can never catch up, but, but I think that's kind of the point, yeah. right? And so for me, it's a, it's a question of, well, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we spend time thinking about some of the base circumstances, mm -hmm. right? So sufferation, sufferation as a landscape in which, you know, or, you know, in which these other processes can function on top, right? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we get at the core the core matter of satisfying, right? You know what you and your work, Nadia, call this kind of like horizon of longing, right? This constant need to you know, this constant sense of dissatisfaction, mm -hmm. like it's heartbreaking, it's it's heartrending, right? To actually have such a sad relationship the place that we're from and and so you know for me the scammer just you know studying the scammers my friends as professor thomas noted that they are well, you know i'm friends with all kinds of people right but the point is that looking at what the scammers do is just one way of thinking about that and i think the process of reconciliation across these various modes is something that is a is another is another kind of project right mm -hmm. And I think what to kind of make make good on, right? Again, taking other cues from, you know, from a whole bunch of people, but including David Scott, right? Which, you know, you know, who said, listen, we have we have to actually think about this teleology of liberation, right? 
I mean, and, and that to me was the most important that was represented. And that's why in my dissertation, they came last, right? Because, you know, every other group, right? Every other group um, was invested in one way or another, right? In the success of the state or in the success of the sovereignty that the state represented. And the you know, with all located senses of so many things that they had, where to my mind, the most promising example Right, of uh, a modality of future orientation. And I'm not gonna assign it any kind of ethical domain of liberation, emancipation, freedom. But again, looking you know, to the future that did not have those same investments, was not restricted and limited. And so to my mind, what that means as a starting point, Nadia, that gets us to you know, a place where we can begin to dismantle this notion of these various attachments that we have, mm -hmm. right? And so, I've been talking to a few, you know, of these, there's, I don't know, Deb is weird, right? When young people start talking to you about your stuff. So a few young people have started to talk to me about this book and they're really fascinated with, young Jamaicans have begun talking to me, they're really fascinated with the, you know, the reports that so many scammers are turning to Obia, right? And, and you can imagine, <laughs> Right, you can imagine, and this is something that I've seen and something that I've talked to, you know, some of my friends about, right? But what the scammers are doing, it's like they're bringing Obia back into a kind of national discourse in a way where the most radical set of, you know, Black Jamaicans, i.e. the Rastafarians were anti-Obia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have Capleton 20 years ago singing about kicking over the Obia man pot and these kinds, so the fact that the scammers can do that, that means that what they are doing is they've, they have, as I called it, a techno, a techno geographic breach. Mm -hmm. They've created a multiplicity of breaches, right? This is not, you know, this is not the kind of uh, anti-respectability, right? That is somehow invested in being counter to respectability. This is a kind of anti-respectability that is, you know, has no investment in the notion of a framework. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. It is a truly radical sense of the individual and that has consequences for blackness, right? That has consequences for the notion of what it means to be Jamaican. I mean, that's why I call their sense of sovereignty an ambivalent one, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, what is sovereignty that is not invested in being sovereign, mm -hmm. right? So that is the level of detachment, of uninvestment to me that the scammers represent. Mm -hmm. Like having freedom and not caring about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like that is something that I think is, is truly radical. And I think what that does to kind of answer your question, Nadia, and the scammers don't do that, right? So the questions that you've asked, especially around the issues of gendering and so forth, the scammers in many ways are still caught up in, in those same old patterns, but what they, what they signal, right, is a kind of structural reorientation or structural readjustment, right, to, to, to upend these normative categories. And I think, you know, I hope, especially with some of these youths who are talking, to me that this is the way that it's going um so that so that's that right i think i think i don't know that, my, can, I, can i interject for a second please, please. um Jovan? because please. i think that's what's so um you know it's the scammers don't have to do that right you are opening an analytic space for us to do that right because you are unhinging sovereignty and I think you're you're about to hear a noise. It's a thing in Philly, really loud motorcycles and cars. It's as though we're in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, in unhinging sovereignty from the seizure of the state, right? Then by, by looking at it through these more affective lenses, and I, you know, it's my obsession, but still, you know, we can think through sufferation we can think through injury and repair you know that by doing that then you remove the um the necessity of kind of the the normative binaristic strictures related to economy politics gender sexuality right and so then that it's it's taking that framework that allows us then i think to to do the kind of work that Nadia is asking for, you know, because if if everything is going to be up in the air, and I, it, you know, I've been obsessed with Bataille lately on sovereignty and these kinds of unhinging of projects, right? The excess 
And sometimes the excess for him is read in terms of sexuality, but it's not merely sexuality. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, um, it's a refusal of the project, you know, of being captured into a kind of liberal normative mode of organizing life, gendered, um, gendered participation in political and economic marketplaces. You know, it's, it's the undoing of those kinds of things that then can allow other um, non-tethered, you know, forms of being to emerge and you know you've landed on one in a way you know with the the scammers but it's not for them necessarily to reformulate the analytical um, distinctions that we often make within uh, our thinking about these processes or how we would normally kind of think through articulations around race gender sexuality political economy etc um, but because it's because they're reaching outside of normative liberal modes we can then ourselves do that kind of rethinking on their coattails in a way that's interesting i, I have i have some I, I hear all of that and i i have some queries with it still ju just in the just in the sense that what Javon shows so clearly is the is the sophisticated signs reading right of all of these the, the, who are providing a kind of analysis themselves of the kind of work that they're doing and so it's a question of what direction that analysis takes them in and which ones remain obs obscure or at least unarticulated um but th I think something that speaks to that is something that is coming up in the Q&A which is um which is there's a, qu a series of questions that has to do with the reframing of of reparations from the collective to the individual and I think both both you, Javon and Deb, were, were describing this, and and it, it ties in with what we've described. We were just talking about in terms of the radical potential of untethering from normative ideas of sovereignty. Um, you know, I, Javon, I, I hear you saying that the sort of um, the the seizure and claim of reparations in the individual life has a kind of radical ethics inside of it. <laughs> um, and I think what I'm understanding the questioner to be bringing up is like, how can we articulate the potential underside of that? Is there a potential underside of that? Like, what do we give up if we give up on any articulation of the collective? I mean, I think obviously we're all divesting from a kind of failed liberal project, uh, from a state project, from, you know, certainly capitalism doing anything collective for us. But, but is there what do we lose if we if we abandon entirely a potential for a collective set of discourses around this? And if, yeah, um, I feel like that ties in with some of my sense of the conundrum of framing any kind of ethical claim at all. And I would just add to that then, um, how is that gendered? You know, yeah. I mean, to my mind, the, the point is we lose everything. And that's kind of the point. And and you know, there's an issue of attachment here, right? The, the, the issue of attachment is that thing which compromises every single iteration of the political project, whether it's emancipation, independence, you know, whatever we're trying to do now. Um, whether it's an attachment to this notion of, I mean, Deb, you know, you know, modern blackness is, you know, makes this point throughout. You know what I mean? The 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 kind of the kind of disruption to the kind of project of, of, of independence was largely undermined by this attachment to the kind of the, you know, the, you know, notions of, of, you know, Victorian, you know, civilization and civility that, that rep was represented by the kind of Creole, the Creole, uh, you know, the Creole nationalist project, right? And, and so for me, you know, the argument that I'm trying to make is that we have to actually ask that question which is, you know, what does, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Dennis Brown, you know, and he, he asked, you know, do you know what it means to have a revolution? And it's a real question, right? Because you, you can't have a revolution and not want to not want to die. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't go into the, into the battlefield and, and worry about losing your life. And so for me, you know, the question is blackness is on, is on the line. We have to be willing to, you know, and people might cost me, but, you know, you have to be willing to let go of that for a moment to see, well, what can you become on the other side of that? And that to me, that to me is a question that is legitimately asked by the very functionality of repair and reparation, 
right? If reparation is, right, the kind of formal recognition and compensation for injury. If we in like say a Du Boisian manner believe that blackness is formed through the collective and shared injury and suffering, right, of, you know, slavery and coloniality and so forth. Then if reparation not only, you know, accounts for injury, but reparation in that, by virtue of that same logic, like logically undoes the collective claim of injury that holds blackness up. So we haven't even yet begun to consider what, what does blackness mean, right? Once our claim, our ability to make a claim for injury expires, because that is what reparations would to my mind actually bring up, right? An expiration of the claim of injury. What does it mean after that point then to be black? What, is, what does blackness mean in, in a very, you know, perhaps not in an everyday way, right? Because we, right? But meaning in terms of the kinds of claims that can be made in the kinds of conceptual ideologies that hold it together, you know, that's what's, that's what's at stake. Um, you know, and, and how that is gendered, you know, is, is, is equally at stake. And, and you know, I, I take some comfort in the fact that at least, pol not politically, but, you know, maybe, you know, in our cultural politics, um, you know, we are, we, we are absolutely advancing, right, in this way where we are opening up these categories. But what is, what is troubling is that we are in many ways just reproducing new categories, right? And I think, you know, Fanon and Winter are telling us that we actually have to move past that, that, that insistence upon recategorizing. And, you know, if we don't, we know what we will get effectively. Um, you know, so to me, so to me, we have to do the thing where we actually throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and until ethically we are comfortable doing that, then we will be limited, then our political projects will be stunted, right, yeah. then reparations will be nothing more than, you know, what we got from the Civil Rights Act, will be nothing more than what we got with the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, right, so the fact that we can have those projects, you know, we can have these milestone achievements um, in liberation, right, Yet here we are facing the trial, right, of Derek Chauvin, right? What does that actually mean? And so for me, that's 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 what's at stake. Everything. Yeah, and I think also the the reason I asked that question is because I think about the scammers as one refusal of sort of normative, mm -hmm. liberal, and progressive, you know, terms of sovereignty, and so their operation you know, looks a certain way in the world. And then, you know, the women activists who are trying to preserve community access to the beach is another kind of refusal of the state, but it's framed very differently. So that that was the gendering that, that you made me think of, Nadia, when you were asking those questions, because it also then is a, it, it's a different vision of something else, what John sometimes calls something else right? Of <laughs> something else, you know, outside, I don't want to do that teleological thing, but rooted in very different practices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like the scammers, like would we call them enacting a practice of care right. in the same way that we might call you know, some of some of the very local level activism that Miziki Thane is studying, for example, we would call that an ethic of care. So is there, like their seizure doesn't read in that same way, you know, and I'm not saying it should, I'm just saying, I think, you know, there are different ways to conceptualize, or perhaps there are different ways to conceptualize this practice of refusal, I guess, in that way. Yeah, and I, I think also I was thinking, I was thinking of the sort of, the laboring woman who sort of, you know, has her head down, is just trying to put food on that, you know, that kind of discourse of the sort of ongoingness of everyday practice, which is in a way divested from the state as well, right? That, that woman has no sense that the, the Jamaican nation or the, the global connection of capital or coloniality is going to give her anything. And so there is a kind of logic of um, ongoingness, separation from disinvestment from certain kinds of structures, but that's not called a scam, right? So it's, there's just something, there's something very interesting about um, how gender, how certain kinds of subjective positionalities open up certain kinds of um, claims and possibilities. And then on the other side of that, what you were saying, Javon, just now about like, you know, what does it mean to try and conceive of new 
subjectivities outside of any category, right, which is the kind of big work we have to do. Um, I think there, there continues to be questions in the Q&A about um, is there a framework outside of the sort of liberal individual that we can imagine on the other side of this, right? And I think there is a there is the work to be done to try and think about what, for instance, a kind of coalitional politics might look like, which is different, which is different from a certain from a radical individualism, and is also different from um, identitarian impositions that come from state practice or coloniality. And I don't know that that's a question. That's just a certain. That's maybe just moving along with what you're saying. That the, the radical project of imagining what what comes on the other side of both the failure of state and capital and, and on the other side of the scam, right? Um, is a huge imaginative project. It is, and you know, so there was a question in the, in, there's a ton of really fantastic questions in the thing. And I'm really sad we probably won't get to answer all yeah, of them. Yeah, sorry about that. There is a, there is a question of just about the individuality, the individuality um, um, would you say that to some degree scammers in fact are operating within the dominant neoliberal values of the day and yes that's exactly the point right so structural adjustment is you know going back to the, the dissertation my argument has been at every kind of moment has been marked ethically the ethical conjunction if you will that's kind of underpinned by a kind of political economic operation but if we think that if we think that emancipation and independence right all of these things right have 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 you know structured the kind of cultural response and we could look at various markers you know culturally speaking right we see the rastafarians we see you know a kind of pentecostalism we see all kinds of things responding to this conjuncture um then the scammers are responding to the conjuncture that is this kind of structural adjustment moment right but what is what is novel is that and what is troubling is is that it is this moment that is seen to have given the greater sense of liberty right and so the political state, independence, sovereignty, none of, none of it can provide or has provided this actual mobility, right? This actual fulfillment of the subject as not necessarily a citizen, but as a subject. And so it, it, you know, it's a question is what does individuality mean, right? And I think going back to the earlier, the earlier discussion, and I'm like rushing to just try and make my point before we're done, um, is that it seems as if one of the events, one of the investments, one of the attachments, right? is that we have to somehow work out our politics of solidarity before we do the work of dismantling, right? Whereas what the scammer represents and what Deb is pointing us to is that there is a variety of ways that we do the work of dismantling. The project thereafter is the work of solidarity, right? So, you know, I'm not trying to say that the scammer is the model for, you know, the new human. What I'm saying is that the scammer allows, I mean, the scammer is a model for lots of current notions of the human. That's the point, really, right? Um, but what the scammer does, right, is like these other actors, right, um, is, is doing the work, right, the separate yet, you know, singular work of, of slowly dismantling, of, of disrupting the kind of normative and, you know, respectability, respectability oriented, you know, sense of what, you know, our society should be. Um, and, you know, and so I have so many more things to say, but, you know, I, you know, Nadia, just quickly, you know, you talk about the kind of laboring woman. I spent a lot of time working with, 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 with craft vendors, all, all women, you know what I mean? And so, you know, they're different because, because they're Christian, because they, you know, why they may not be thinking about the state, right? And I, and, you know, my sense of ambivalent sovereignty is that people don't, you know, Jamaicans take it for granted, right? Jamaicans take what they have for granted when you compare that to say the way that the, the black American subject experiences their political reality. But what the craft vendor woman does worry about are the consequences of the state. There is still, there is still a commitment to that general state project, right? Um, and, and for the scammer, there's not that same commitment. And so they are different in that way. Um, you know, the scammer, the scammer has a satirical sense of, of, of what governance means, of what sovereignty means. It means nothing because you know what, it's done nothing for me. So it cannot mean anything. Whereas for the craft woman, she hopes that the state will provide. She goes and she, you know, participates in her partner. She does these things in order to get her youth into school, in order to do these kinds of things so that, that you could hope, hopefully one day fulfill the notion of citizenship. The scammer's like, nah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Let me just go earn my money and pop champagne and go live my life, you know? All right, I think we're at. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, great, Jovan. And all this shows is that obviously we have to have another get together yeah, at some yeah, yeah. point <laughs> where we and all of those who who want, who are here, can get together and talk more. Yeah. Thank you for all of your questions. I apologize I wasn't able to address all of them, um, but this has just been really wonderful. Thank you both so much. And for everyone gathered who I can't see, <laughs> thank you very, very much. I, I think that I'm, I'm responsible for bringing us to a close and I think we're gonna get booted out of the webinar, webinar at any time now. So I, I'll just say again, Javon, congratulations on the book. Thank and you it's, so much. It's a wonderful achievement. To, just lovely to talk with you as always. And what a dynamic conversation to just <laughs> make together. Awesome. Um, and um, this will be posted, is that correct? On, on the Matrix website. So if there's anyone who wants to revisit some of these questions or to, to circulate it, then uh, this should be available very soon after that. But um, thank you to everyone. And if I could just say quickly that you both mean so much to me and your work means so much to me. And again, I would just wanna end on the just rare gift that this, this has been. Um, and I appreciate love you both and just give thanks, you know. <laughs> thank you, Javon. All right, thank you. All right, bye everyone. Bye everybody.